Let's continue with the nervous system today by looking at senses. Now let's first think about what a sense is, a means by which the brain receives information about the environment and the body. So there's an enormous amount of information coming in about just through the body, just to maintain homeostasis. And of course, most of that you're not consciously aware of, but of course you also need to be very well, very aware of your environment. Think about how your sight gives you the majority of that. And think about hearing, smelling, touch, or so many sensations involved with it. So with a particular sensation or perception, you can often think of this as the conscious awareness of stimuli received by some type of sensory receptor. And there are many different types of sensory receptors. We're going to look at some of those in this video here. So look at the steps to sensation. You got to first have some type of stimulus, whatever that may be. It may come from inside or outside the body, but an action potential, which is an electric signal, must be created. And of course, you got to generate that and send it back to the central nervous system if you're going to perceive it. Within the central nervous system, you got to have all these nerves, all these axons, bringing these action potentials in the cerebral cortex, and of course, some other parts of the brain too. And after these action potentials reach the cerebral cortex, you got to be able to translate them into whatever that sensation is. So notice two big general types of senses here, general and special. Now, when you look at the general, these sensations are not isolated to one particular region of the body. You find them over a very wide region. Think about something like touch or pain. And then with special senses, these are isolated to one very small particular region. So looking back at the general up here, again, these are spread out over a wide part of the body, and there's two different types of general senses, somatic and visceral. When you're about somatic, think about information about the body and the environment. Good examples of this are touch, pressure, temperature, and pain. But then you can also look at the visceral receptors. When you hear about visceral, think about it coming from internal organs, things from inside of your body, especially the trunk, what you think of as your guts and such in here. And of course, you tend to get pain and pressure senses from those visceral. But then looking back at the special, remember, these are the ones isolated to a small region of the body. Smell, obviously, just isolated to your nose. Taste, primarily just with your tongue sight with your eyes, hearing with many structures along with your ears, and then balance along with those inner ear regions too. So again, those are special. Those are isolated to a particular region. Now look at some other different types of sensory receptors. First one we have right here, mechanoreceptors. When you hear about mechano or mechanical, something's being moved in some way or another. So you can think about special mechanoreceptors that detect compression, bending, stretching, touch, pressure, hearing, balance, all those are good examples of mechanoreceptors. Because you look at something like hearing or balance, something within your inner ear must be moved for that to work. That's what mechanoreceptors are all about. Then we look at chemoreceptors. Here you're talking about the detection of chemicals. That's exactly what happens with smell and taste. Third, we have thermoreceptors. Here are the detecting changes in temperature. Of course, you see a lot of these superficial in the skin, and they can detect temperature changes of just one degree. Photoreceptors, detecting different wavelengths of light, of course, are found in the retina of the eyes. May have seen that previously before. If not, you'll see that on a future video. So, of course, that's our vision. <clears throat> and then we have nociceptors, detecting pain. You're talking about damage in any way. Damage can occur in many different ways. Those nociceptors can detect them. So looking at some other categories of receptors, notice how there's many different ways you can scatter them out and group them. Next we see here is exteroreceptors. Notice how the first of that sounds a little like external because these are very superficial in the body. They're going to be found in the skin, the integumentary system. Next we see visceroreceptors. Again, you hear visceral, think about your deep internal organs. So these are a lot deeper in the body. And then third here, we see propyl receptors. These may have been discussed back with reflex arcs and such. You can see these detecting changes in tension, in tendons, along close to joints, and in between those in muscles. Can tell you what your body position is, whether your eyes are closed or open, so we don't have to actually see your body, to know whether your hands are down at your side or up above your head. And they can tell you how much tension's in a muscle. In other words, if your eyes are closed, you know if you're holding something light versus something that's heavy. But let's look at a different type here, free nerve endings. These are the simplest and the most common type of sensory receptor. 
So you see these all throughout the body in many different places. A lot of those in the visceral regions too. Look at different types for just temperature. There are those for cold and hot. And the cold are far more abundant than what those are for detecting warmer, hotter temperatures. The cold are about 10 to 15 times more numerous. And pain receptors are free nerve endings too. So when you think about detecting those changes in temperature or damage, those are your free nerve endings. We have the Merkel, or also called the tactile discs. Now these little branches of axons right here would be found in the basal layer of the epidermis. Remember the epidermis is the outer layer of the integumentary system. The basal layer is the deepest of the five strata. But point being, these are very superficial in the body. And since they're very close to the surface, they're good for detecting light touch and superficial pressure. Then we've got hair follicle receptors. These can respond to just the slightest movement of hairs. Say something like a tiny bug is walking over the surface of the skin and maybe it just moves one little hair. <clears throat> That's all it can take to activate a hair follicle receptor. Then we have these Pacinian corpuscles. Now notice these are a lot deeper in the integumentary system. Near the deeper layers of the dermis or maybe even down into that hypodermis. So since these are deeper, they're not going to detect light pressure but a deeper pressure and also vibrations at the same time. Next here we have the Meissner's, also called tactile corpuscles, which give you two-point discrimination. In some areas of the body, like on your face and other regions, there's a greater concentration of these little receptors. That's how you can detect if two points are very close to each other but still separate. It's like if you had a device with two little sharp points and they're very close to each other. You touch something like your face or the tip of your tongue, you'll be able to tell that's two separate pressure points because there's a high concentration of these Meissner corpuscles there. But go to some place like your back or something like that where they're not nearly as concentrated, you still have those two points close together. It'd probably feel like one point instead of two like it did on your face or tongue. Then next year we have these roughening in organs. Primarily, you see this in the dermis of the fingers, and they're good for responding to continuous touch or pressure. Muscle spindles were mentioned back with the spinal cord. We looked at reflex arcs. These are involved with keeping constant tension on your posture muscles. They can detect just the tiniest amount of stretching of a skeletal muscle. And if they do, they make that muscle contract a bit. That keeps tension on your posture muscles, so you don't have to think about that with your conscious thought. Freeze up your mind to do whatever it is you need. And then here's the Golgi tendon organs. Remember, you find these in tendons, and they detect very intense pulling. In other words, they keep you from tearing these tendons. That's why if you lift something that's heavy, you want to lift slow. They'll give this Golgi tendon organ time to detect that intense tension and if it starts to damage that tension, it'll shut that muscle off. If you snap and jerk with a weight quickly, this won't be able to work quick enough and you might damage or tear something that ordinarily you would not have. 